Dear friends, dear colleagues, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome Dima Tosiatsky to as uh, next speaker to our online seminar. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Dima, for accepting our invitation. It is uh, half past six in the morning in mm -hmm. Seattle. So, uh, Dima received uh, his PhD from uh, Cornell University in 2013. Uh, this was followed by a postdoc position at the University of Waterloo. And uh, one year later, he received a, a position from the University of Washington in Seattle as an assistant professor. So he moved in 2014 to Seattle. So uh, Dima did at the beginning of his career, I would say uh, research focused on more theoretical topics. So related to flash analysis, nonstop analysis, uh, yeah, uh, very much uh, in, in cooperation with Adrian Lewis and uh, Alex Joffe, but in the last years, he, he moved to, to algorithms, to, to solution methods for large scale problems, to start optimization uh, algorithms. And uh, yeah, he, he wrote uh, yeah, uh, several nice papers. So today, yeah, his topic will be on stochastic methods for optimization. So Dima, the floor is yours. Thanks, Radu. Um, thanks a lot also for inviting me. It's uh, great to speak. Uh, actually, this is the first time I'm giving a Zoom talk. Um, and it's also the first time I'm giving this talk. So uh, there might be some typos, but hopefully not too many. Okay, so uh, this is joint work with uh, Lin Zhao, who's now at Facebook AI, but this work was done was, uh, when, during the summer when I spent some time at Microsoft Research, where both of us were. Okay, so... Oops. Okay, so uh, plainly put, this is what this talk is about. We're gonna be interested in stochastic optimization problems uh, where the distribution that governs the data is not fixed. So typically when we think about stochastic, uh, single stage stochastic optimization problems, we think about the distribution that generates the data as being fixed. Um, in this talk, I will be thinking about problems where distribution actually depends on the decision variable. Okay, and there are a number of different ways to think about such problems. What does it mean to even solve such a problem? You know, what, what is a solution really? Uh, and I'll mostly be following the framework that was set out in a group uh, from Berkeley uh, in the two papers that are on the screen. And I'll come back to these um, uh, papers uh, as we go on and I'll talk about them in some more detail. Okay, so I'll begin. Uh, so uh, uh, essentially, so I have about 25 slides or so. So the, essentially the first 10, 11 slides are going to be somehow an introduction to this problem class and why one should care about it and what um, sort of our, what's known and what it, our contribution is. And then the last um, uh, 15 slides or so are gonna be kind of the technical content. So the first, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes are gonna be kind of uh, light, let's say. Hopefully you, you, you'll, you'll think so too. Okay, and I'll begin with the motivation. So nowadays, uh, very much of stochastic optimization is motivated by applications in machine learning and uh, large scale computation. And so this talk is also mo motivated by um, some problems in machine learning. So that's what I would like to uh, ex explain first. Uh, okay, so let me begin at the beginning. Um, so the standard, uh, the most basic model for learning is called supervised learning. And it's kind of, here's a schematic of what that looks like. And typically you think about supervised learning uh, as a two-stage process. The first process, the first stage is where an algorithm works. And the second stage is where you evaluate the algorithm. So in the first stage training, um, you have a certain uh, set of data generated according to the probability distribution P, then you feed that data into an algorithm. An algorithm outputs an answer. The, the answer is, let's say, we'll call it the learning rule, okay? So how do you evaluate if, the, if an algorithm did a good job? Well, that's sort of the second stage where a new data comes in from the same distribution. So new data comes in. You apply your learning rule, like a classifier, and, that, uh, and then you get a prediction, okay? And so the way you judge the performance of the first stage is how well it does on the second stage. Okay, however, uh, right? And so the key assumption that's made is that both the test data uh, and the training data, so the training data, the data that's used to feed into the algorithm to learn a classifier, let's say, is the same, that distribution that governs it is the same as the distribution of the new data according to which you evaluate how good it was your algorithm, your decision that your algorithm made. However, in many cases, 
uh, the situation is not so simple. The situation is more involved. Where in the learn, and I'll give you some examples in a second, where in a learning rule, like a classifier, so if the data goes in, the classifier comes out, but just that mere exists, you know, that, that uh, uh, having that classifier, um, uh, that classifier impacts the distribution of the new data according to which you're going to e uh, evaluate its performance. Okay, so let me just give you an example of what that looks like. So you can imagine, for example, that, uh, uh, so these are very concrete examples. So suppose you have a bank, okay? So the bank is, is trying to uh, figure out whether to um, give a person a, a loan. So just by making a decision whether a person or some people get a loan, they influence those, uh, person, those people's debt and credit score and loans, a uh, number of loans, et cetera. So they, the, the, inf the classifier they use, just the deployment of a classifier in itself, changes the distribution of the, uh, of the population, according to which, um, yeah, so it changes the distribution of population, changes the, you know, what the population looks like. This is kind of a passive interaction. A more interesting situation occurs where the decision you take uh, influences new data is, when, is um, uh, when the population tries to alter their own features in order to kind of game the system. So again, in the same banking example, you can imagine that the bank, that the individuals in the population have an idea of how the bank makes decisions with uh, respect to loans. And the individuals would alter their own features in order to increase the likelihood of loan approval. So in other words, uh, having some insight into what the classification process looks like for the bank, that the population themselves, the people themselves will actually um, alter their own uh, uh, attributes, their own features in order to make you know, the possibility of them getting a loan higher. Okay, so it's kind of an active interaction in literature it's called strategic behavior gaming. Okay, so you see that there's an interaction and just the, having a learning rule in the second stage impacts the distribution of the data. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. Please ask questions if something's not clear, by the way. Um, okay. okay, so this is all kind of uh, motivation. And uh, okay, and this sort of setting, the setup where the learning rule impacts the new data is called performative prediction this paper had mentioned uh, before. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the motivation. So mathematically, what does that look like if you want to model that as an optimization problem? Well, it looks like this. It's exactly what I had in the first slide. So you're really trying to minim you're trying to find a, um, a, a parameter, a learning rule, let's say, because now I'll switch to stochastic optimization kind of a notation X, okay? So you wanna find the decision variable X so that X does not do well with respect to the distribution, with respect to some fixed distribution, but, it, but X should do well with respect to the distribution that X itself induces. So you pick X, then the population reacts, and then X should be good with respect to the reaction of the population. So it's just kind of this uh, um, kind of a feedback mechanism. Okay, that's exactly what was on the same on the previous picture. So that's the motivation. But mathematically, you're just interested in minimizing a stochastic optimization problem where the distribution now depends on the decision variable, okay? Okay, so the notation is that D are going to, going to be now uh, a family of state dependent distributions accessible only by sampling. Uh, L is going to be a convex loss as usual, and R is a convex structure inducing regularity. Okay, so in other words, so again, I just want to stress this viewpoint that the decision X is not just is not judged according to the distrib some uh, fixed distribution or even the data that was used to learn X. It's just according. It is going to be judged according to the downstream distribution that X induces. So when you're choosing X, you have no access to D of X, right? So it's a kind of a circular, circular kind of logic here, okay? Okay, so bad news is, the, is as stated, this optimization problem uh, is awful, okay? So if you make no assumptions about variability of D or how D varies, this problem is non-smooth and non-convex. I mean, imagine that is a, this the D is a discrete kind of probability distribution. So then this is just a big sum and you have multipliers that are varying and possibly in highly non-smooth ways. Okay. So solving this problem directly may be very hard. And so you can, so there are two ways as usual to um, when your problem is too hard, you can either uh, make more assumptions on the data. So for example, you can impose certain smoothness assumptions on how D on how the distribution varies. So you know, smooth density and so, et cetera. And then, okay, it's gonna be non-convex. Maybe you can settle for critical points. And so there are a few papers that do that. So one, one paper uh, is listed here. 
they, they kind of use that viewpoint together with the frame full procedure. Okay, so that's not what I will talk about. A different uh, approach, uh, which is uh, advocated in, in this paper uh, by Perdomo et al, is to uh, change our viewpoint a little bit and settle for a related, different, but a related solution concept that's efficiently computable. So it will not be a critical point in any reasonable sense of this problem. It will be something different, but hopefully not too different. Okay, and so this is this is uh, what I will talk about now. Okay, so okay, so uh, to state what uh, I mean by this a different solution concept, let me introduce some notation. Okay, so in essence, I won't be looking for uh, even a local minimizer of this problem. I'll be looking at some notion of an equilibrium point. Okay, I'll be looking at some notion of an equilibrium point, which turns out to be efficiently computable in some in uh, reasonable regimes. Okay, so to state this, I'm gonna uh, introduce notation. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit annoying to carry these expectations around. So I'm going to introduce notation F sub Y of X and I'll use this throughout the talk. So F sub Y of X, so let's just parse that. It's just the expectation of the loss evaluated at X, but with the distribution given by Y. Okay, so the subscript is going to index the distribution that guides the expectation and the X is just the input to L. Okay, and the, the gradient is just always the gradient with respect to X. So when I write down grad F sub Y, it's always the gradient with respect to the, 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 the X. And so you can throw in, put in the gradient and stuff. Okay, okay so, uh, okay, so we're gonna, here's, here's the viewpoint we're going to take. Rather than, truly, rather than truly looking for the solution of this problem, we're going to look at an, a certain equilibrium point. Okay, so here's the key definition from the paper of Perdomo et al. They say that the point is at equilibrium for the family of distributions if X bar okay, solves the static problem that X bar induces. So in other words, you take X bar, so you say that X bar is equilibrium, if the following is true, you take X bar, you, you look at the uh, problem where X bar induces that, uh, you, you look at the problem corresponding to the distribution induced by X bar and you minimize over the loss. Okay, so you just fix the distribution at X bar and then you minimize. If X bar pops out as the solution of that problem, then set to be at equilibrium. Okay, so the idea is that if you fix X bar, okay, then, and you look at the response of the population D of X bar, then according to the response, there is no incentive to change your, uh, your decision variable X bar. That's the idea. So you fix X bar, you, um, you, uh, that defines a static problem where distribution is now fixed, it's not varying. There's no, you kind of decouple the distribution from the, from the decision variable. The, this is now X bar. And now you, you're just asking, okay, with that distribution fixed, uh, does it make sense to change uh, the, the decision variable to something else? If the answer is no, if they, uh, uh, then you say that point is at equilibrium. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, so uh, very good. So these are the points we're going to be studying. Okay, and it turns out finding equilibrium points uh, is possible, and under reasonable conditions, in fact, equilibrium points are not that far from the true solutions of the problem we're after. Okay, good. Um, now. Uh, algorithmically, algorithmically, you can also think about, uh, so it's very clear that, okay, equilibrium has to do with fixed points. So in fact, uh, very, yes, uh, you can think about equilibrium as fixed points of a certain map. Uh, and that map uh, is just written out here. So for every Y, you look at the static problem that's induced by Y. So you fix the distribution at Y and you minimize over the X. That gives you an answer. So define this map, S of Y. It gives you an output of the argument uh, when for the Y, for the distribution corresponding to Y. Uh, and so by, the, the, by definition, equilibrium points are just fixed points of this iteration. Okay, right, so what does it mean? So you, the Y and the Y, you put the X bar and the X bar. So the, the, this equation is the same as being a fixed point for this uh, minimization, right? So, so the, okay, very good. Okay, and that suggests a fixed point algorithm. So the fixed point algorithm, like in long form, just looks like this. Okay, so it's a conceptual algorithm, but let, let's think, let's look at that. So the conceptual algorithm is simply the following. Uh, for every iteration T, you look at, uh, you look at 
you you pin you pin down the distribution. So you have iteration x t, you pin down this distribution, and you minimize over the x. So this is now a static problem. You minimize over the x, that gives you x t plus one. Then x t plus one induces the next static problem because that gives you the distribution. You minimize out again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the fixed point iteration. It's called repeated minimization, right? So you just keep minimizing under different distributions. So you allow the distribution to vary along the iteration. Okay. Okay, and so this kind of procedure, just uh, uh, looking at it, immediately uh, uh, suggests uh, a, a, a whole class of algorithms. Right? So, okay, so this is a conceptual algorithm because you can't really uh, minimize, you can't really solve this problem to exactly because, okay, so there's an expectation here. So you might not have access to full data. There is, um, uh, you know, there's some inexactness, et cetera. But in any case, if you just realize that you're looking for fixed points, you know, if you're really just trying to emulate this process, uh, that suggests you can just heuristically um, apply all sorts of algorithms, classical algorithms, simply to the static problem, then take a step, then apply some algorithm, a static uh, algorithm to this uh, problem, take a step, et cetera. So for example, the, just to be very concrete, uh, what does a proximal stochastic gradient look like? Well, you just take a stochastic, a proximal stochastic gradient step on the static problem, then you update the distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So formally, you would sample ZT according to the distribution at XT. Then you take a proximal gradient step. And now the new XT plus one induces the next distribution. So in other words, this is a procedure that simply takes a single stochastic proximal gradient step on this problem. Okay. And you can emulate this for all sorts of static algorithms, right? So you take any algorithm from classical, from stochastic optimization that's designed for a fixed distribution, you perform it, let's say, for one step uh, on the static problem, update the distribution, and so on. So, so just you're just really, all you're doing is you're changing one line of code, let's say, that um, doesn't just use a fixed distribution, it allows the distribution to vary along every iteration. Okay, so that's, the, and you can, you can, you know, you can just uh, do, do this sort of thing for all sorts of algorithms. Okay, so uh, in fact, uh, so what Perdomo et al. did, and I'll talk about this more later, uh, is they um, talked about, uh, so they analyzed these sorts of procedures or so, some, some, uh, some specific variants of these sorts of procedures. Uh, first of all, they established a criteria for existence of equilibria. So it, it, I didn't say anything about existence of equilibria at, the point, uh, at this point, right? We're looking, talking about existence of fixed points. So you need to prove something, so they, they did. Um, they uh, analyze this fixed point iteration, this conceptual algorithm, right? So some fixed point iteration, there's no, you know, generic, uh, so you need to do something to figure out why it converges and when it converges. So they did that. And they also then uh, looked at the projected stochastic uh, gradient method. So they, uh, their R was an indicator function. So that, that's kind of their uh, fundamental contributions. Okay. Okay. So what is it that I will talk about? Okay, so, so that's kind of the state of the art. And I'll talk more about those results later. But okay, so what am, what am I going to talk, talk about? Well, uh, I want to give a recipe, in fact, for understanding a whole, whole wide class of algorithms for these slightly dynamic problems. And so, what, uh, and so what I will do is I will verify a meta theorem in a variety of cases. And the meta theorem says the following. This, the, before reading it, essentially the meta theorem simply says that uh, that uh, it, it, that uh, problems are under these kind of varying distributions, as if you allow the vary, a distribution to vary and you apply your standard algorithms, can be understood in a somewhat classical way. Okay, so what, they, what, the, what I'm going to verify is in the following, that algorithms, st static al uh, algorithms that are designed for static problems, if you simply allow them, uh, you simply apply them, but allow the distribution to vary along the iteration. So take your favorite algorithm, but now instead of uh, every time sampling from the same distribution, you simply allow the distribution to vary along the iterations. In fact, these look like different algorithms, but in fact, they can be viewed as the same algorithm on a static problem being applied to the, to the static problem at equilibrium, okay? So all these algorithms can be understood as really just being applied to a classical static problem, except well, what do I mean by that? So, well, the static problem is defined by distribution you don't know, so you can't really apply anything to this problem. But implicitly, these algorithms, that's what these algorithms do. They're implicitly solving the static problem at equilibrium, except with a bias. So these algorithms are really just being applied implicitly to this equilibrium problem, 
except when they're sampling, there is a bias, which decays very, very quickly to zero as the iterates approach the equilibrium point. So with this viewpoint, you can do many things because you can essentially reduce all sorts of algorithms for static problems to these, to, to these sort of mildly dynamic settings. All you have to do is you have to understand then how does the bias propagate? And the, is it a problem there's a certain bias? Okay, so that's intuitively what I will talk about. Okay, so before getting into the technical details, I just want to show everything, on the, everything I'm going to say or roughly everything I will say on the picture. Uh, so that it sort of becomes very clear. Okay, so let's look at a very, at a, at a toy problem and where everything will be, where this meta theorem is very clear because I can draw a picture. Okay, so the toy problem is, is kind of like chasing the mean. So we're gonna be trying to find the mean of a Gaussian where the, where the mean of the Gaussian kind of varies. Okay, so uh, this is the kind of, uh, this is the toy problem. I'm gonna be looking at minimizing expectation of the norm X minus Z squared, but the distribution is varying. If the distribution were fixed, the answer would be the mean of, of the distribution, but now the distribution actually depends on X. So we're kind of chasing the mean and uh, I'll choose a very specific distribution for just for illustration. So the way the distribution varies, it's just gonna be a normal with a mean, then what the mean does is it just flips who is X1, who is X2. So it flips the coordinates and multiplies by row. Row is going to be some uh, 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 trade-off parameter that I'm gonna uh, play with to see how, how, how uh, algorithms work, okay? So does, does that make sense? So there's just some some kind of pro, uh, some kind of dynamic problem where I, I chose the distribution to be a normal with a with a, um, uh, with, a, with the mean that's moving around. Okay, so it's very easy to see the equilibrium. There's all the uh, origin is always an equilibrium point, and as long as rho is not one or minus one, it's the uh, it's the unique equilibrium. Okay. And so what I'm going to uh, uh, do now is I'm going to draw two vector fields. The first vector field is if I uh, is just the gradient at the equilibrium. Okay, so I'm going to draw the gradient of this function at equilibrium. So so this uh, basically says, uh, okay, if I do gradient descent at equilibrium, what what are my trajectories going to look like? And the other vector field is going to be the gradient evaluated at x for the x problem. So this corresponds to what if I do like, let's say a stochastic gradient, I, but I allow the distribution to vary. So with every X, I'm going to compute an unbiased estimator of the gradient for the X problem evaluated at X. Okay, and so uh, you would, so that's the picture you get. Okay, so here are two vector fields. So the blue is the vector field, the gradient vector field, or the minus the gradient vector field at equilibrium. And so everything is pointing inwards towards the origin. The gold is this vector field. This is the vector field you would take if you allow the distribution to vary. So if you do gradient descent, but you allow the distribution to vary. And the thing to note, and this is for rho equals 0 0.25. And the thing to note is everything is very well aligned, okay? All the angles are acute point-wise. The angles between the vector fields are all acute. So they're all pointing roughly in the same direction, okay? So that suggests that if you follow this vector field, uh, you're not that far from following this vector field, at least for rho being 0 0.25. Okay, so I'm going to increase rho. So rho, you should imagine, is telling you about the speed at which the, the mean is moving. So it tells you about the variations in the distribution, how, how, how much variability is there in D. So now this is rho equals 0 0.5, and the situation starts to degrade a little bit. Uh, still, everything, make, like point-wise, all the arrows are, are make an acute angle with each other. So the blue and the... And the and the gold uh, make an acute angle with each other everywhere and they'll point in the right direction. At 0 0.99, things start to degrade a little bit. The angle starts to look more uh, kind of like a right angle. Okay, zero point. So, there is, so you can imagine there's some, something happening at one. So in fact, that's the case. And if you pass that threshold and you're now at 1.25, uh, things really break down. Okay, so now the gold is now pointing in the opposite direction. So everything's kind of breaking down. So there are certain direct, certain, certain places where you, if you initially uh, initiate gradient flow, accord, well, according to this vector field, according to the vector field you would take if you were to, if the distribution vary, you would actually diverge away from the equilibrium. Okay, so what this says, roughly speaking, and in fact, okay, now you've, you, you, this is not uh, misleading. Uh, in fact, if you apply a stochastic uh, gradient method where you allow this distribution to vary, I just drew it, and so I just ran it, and so this is what you get for different rows, and this is with a constant parameter. So what you would expect to see if everything was static, you would expect a linear rate of convergence up to a noise tolerance that depends on the on the on the 
and the step size. And that's in fact exactly what you see even in the, under the, uh, uh, the dynamic settings. So the parameters of row are here. Um, and, the only, and so the thing to note is in fact, uh, all, uh, even in these dynamic settings, uh, what happens is that the noise, you know, the floor to which you're converging to with a fixed parameter eta, if you use a fixed parameter eta for the step size, is the same, it's unaffected by rho, and the only thing that rho does um, is it, uh, it degrades the linear rate of convergence. Okay, so, so what's the kind of, the, so that's kind of the introduction, let's say, and uh, what's kind of the, the punchline? Uh, well, it seems that meta, the meta theorem is valid. Uh, at least when rows between zero and one, because all these vector fields are kind of pointing along the same direction. So that, that's kind of the punch. Okay, and so the rest of the talk uh, is go. And so, okay, so let's remember that. So it's true when the rows between zero and one. So as long as the distribution doesn't vary too much, um, and when the row is bigger than one, uh, strange things happen. Okay, and that, that essentially the rest of the talk is just is trying to is going to verify uh, these sorts of. Um, uh, observations and and uh, go far beyond some great uh, stochastic uh, gradient methods. Okay, so okay, good. Yeah, so feel feel free to ask me questions. Uh, you know, if something's not clear. So that that was kind of the introduction. So now now I'll I'll, I'll do kind of the technical the technical work. Okay, okay. So I'll begin with some. So here's the outline for the rest of the talk. So I'll begin with some uh, notation and uh, assumptions. Uh, and then uh, I'll, essentially all arguments are going to be based on uh, two uh, technical theorems, uh, two technical lemmas. Uh, these are called two deviation inequalities. So, so we'll really be thinking about stability of algorithms to change in distribution. That's what's really driving, um, right? Uh, or, so conceptually what's happening is that you have an algorithm that passes through a sequence, a long sequence of, um, of static problems, but they're all they all governed by a different distribution, and so it's intuitively clear that any kind of analysis should really depend on uh, trying to understand how the variations of these problems with respect to change in the distribution. Okay, and then I'll pass to so that's going to be somehow the, the you know the the technical uh, kind of the, the strategy uh, for understanding these sorts of problems. And then uh, algorithmically, I'll talk about uh, online convex optimization. So I'll, I'll show, in fact, that you can reduce the setting to, in, to online convex optimization. Um, and we'll see this kind of a crude reduction. So it's interesting, but not so interesting. And then I'll directly analyze stochastic accelerated gradient methods um, when the distributions vary and uh, talk about proximal point, clip gradient, and a variety of other algorithms. So that's, that's okay. But but really, I want to provide this recipe for saying how do you take a static an algorithm for static problems and understand it for these mildly dynamic settings. Okay, so here's the beginning of the technical stuff. Okay, so uh, I need some notation. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to uh, uh, so I'm going to be precise. Okay, so the loss is going to uh, uh, take. Um, uh, is going to be defined on R z cross z, so z is where the data lives, it's the, da it's the data space, and it will be a metric space. So it's important for us, I need to be able to, um, uh, uh, so you remember the, you're looking at this example, you see what's happening, it's very important, this row is very important, so I need to understand the variations in the, the distribution. So to understand variations in the distribution, I need to put a metric on the space of probability measures. Okay, so the, the measure, so I'm going to let P be this, uh, the set of probability measures on my data space Z. And I'm going to uh, measure deviations between measures uh, using the Wasserstein one distance. Okay, so if you don't know what that is, uh, you can just, for, for our purposes, you can define it in a dual uh, way. Uh, so all that is, the, if I want to compute the Wasserstein one distance, the deviation between two measures mu and nu, uh, I just uh, look at the supremum of all uh, one Lipschitz functions and then I integrate over mu application of uh, uh, you know g to x minus the expectation over uh, new uh, g to y. Okay, so I just uh, so g are like test functions. So I, I apply g to x, g to y, where x is is, uh, is uh, drawn according to mu and y according to new, and I look at the difference. Okay, so the, the, that's I won't use this definition in, in the slides, but that, that's somehow very fundamental. Okay, very good. Uh, I should mention all these assumptions uh, uh, notation are, are from the paper Perdomo et al. So the setting is really from their paper. Okay, uh, so good. Uh, and now I need to put some, so that's, that's the setting, that's the notation. And then I need to put some assumptions on the loss and I need to put some assumptions on the variations of the distribution, right? The row, 
So that was very important. And so the assumption I'm going to make on the loss is that first of all, the loss is alpha strongly convex. It's not really necessary um, for most results. I just need the expectation of L according to some distributions to be alpha strongly convex. But for simplicity, I'll just assume that the losses themselves are strongly convex, that's the alpha. And then I'll, I'll assume that the gradient is Lipschitz. And uh, it can be Lipschitz, so this is the gradient in X. And it can be Lipschitz with respect to two variables, the X and the Z. So I'll let um, beta be the Lipschitz constant of the gradient with respect to the Z, the data. And L is going to be the Lipschitz constant of the gradient with respect to X. Okay, so this, I won't really use this constant alpha, uh, uh, oh, sorry, let, let me, and one more, one more thing that I need is this variation in, in the distribution. So I assume the distributions are Lipschitz continuous in, in the um, uh, Wasis time one uh, with parameter gamma. Okay, so you don't really need to remember the beta L gamma or alpha, all that you really need to remember are two, two, two letters. Okay, these are like condition letters. That's, those are the only letters that are going to appear. And the first condition measure uh, is just the usual one, L, of, L over alpha. That's the condition number of the problem. It's the, Lipschitz, it's the Lipschitz constant of the gradient in X divided by the strong convexity constant. So that's going to be the kappa kind of standard notation. And then there's the, the row, okay? It's the same row as from the example. What that row is, it's going to measure the total variation in the Z variable. So it's going to take the gamma, multiply by the beta and divide by alpha, okay? So you just remember the row is this is going to be uh, uh, telling us somehow the variations in Z and kappa is going to be the, con the standard condition number. Okay, so Small kappa question. Like, yep. Uh, so we, uh, the beginning of the talk started with this motivation from sort of machine learning problems and uh, this uh, problem of feedback loops and, and I'm thinking specifically about the sensitivity uh, assumption here. Yep. So, uh, could we have some like concrete maybe examples of of what we might expect for that distribution change? Yes. Yeah, so uh, say in a feedback loop ML problem and to yeah, so kind of have an idea thing. if it satisfies this sort of assumption. Yeah. So this gamma. So in the, in, the, in the toy example, the gamma was the row. Okay. Uh, so that was the row. Uh, but in fact, if you look at the concrete example, there's a very nice model for this sort of problem. It's called strategic classification. Uh, where in it's a two player game where very conc concretely the, the you know when the the learning system uh, uh, sends you know deploys a classifier uh, you put a model on the way that the uh, the uh, the uh, population varies uh, changes their attributes in response so for example the the population will uh, shift a few attributes in the direction to better align with the classifier. So the amount by which it shifts uh, is the gamma. Okay, so, so you can, you can, you can, you know, so this is in the paper of Perdomo et al. They, they explain this very nicely. And then also, uh, yeah, use this model in, 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 in our paper as well. Right. Okay, so, so there's very concrete examples where you can write down exactly what, what, what this gamma is, and it's very natural. Okay. Yes, thank you for that question. Okay, very good. So, okay, so I claim that the interesting parameter regime to think about um, is when rows between zero and one, just like in the example. Okay, and the reason is, uh, is it's, it's interesting, is actually very convincing. And so the reason is the following. So you remember the repeated minimization procedure. So this is just, uh, you know, fix the distribution XT, solve the static problem, change the distribution to XT plus one, solve the static problem, et cetera. Well, you can ask when does this when does this procedure converge? Okay, so Perdomo et al. prove the following: that as long as rho is between zero and, and one, so it's smaller than one, then the repeated minimization actually converges to X bar at a linear rate, and the linear rate is exactly rho. Moreover, as we also saw in the example, in fact, um, well, we didn't quite see this in the example, but okay. So if rho is bigger, strictly bigger than one, then the re repeated minimization may actually diverge. And you could sort of see that uh, kind of philosophically in the example we had, because as soon as we passed the row, you know, became bigger than one, the gradient field started to point in the opposite direction, the, 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 this very, uh, varying gradient field. Okay, so the right regime to think about is this row between zero and one. Okay, uh, so in, in fact, uh, uh, this regime is, is really fundamental, and it's not just repeat minimization that converges linearly. There's, it's, it's a, there's a whole wide class of algorithms, so I, I don't have time to uh, get into details, but in particular, proximal point method also converges linearly in this regime. 
Okay, so uh, what's the proximal point method? It's the same as repeated minimization, but you regularize uh, by, by a little quadratic. Um, and uh, again, fixed point of this iteration, I just also equilibrium points. So the fixed points of this iteration are the same as the fixed points of this iteration. Uh, and in fact, the converges linear, but there is a certain advantage. So uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, there's no real advantage of the proximal point method. Uh, however, uh, experimentally or conceptually, there is an advantage to introducing regularization. I just wanna show a quick example on the picture. And it's the following. Uh, and it's sort of probably very clear to optimizers that uh, if we go outside the parameter regime rho, let's say it's bigger than one, you would still hope that some local phenomena takes hold and you might still, it might still work, right? Hopefully in practice. Um, but the problem with the repeat minimization is that uh, it, the, there's no way to control the step, how long the different distance between xt plus one and xt, it's highly unstable. Whereas if you introduce quadratic regularization, then uh, formally there's a notion of distributional stability. And so this algorithm is somehow much more stable. You can control the step size, even in parameter regimes where these algorithms are not supposed to work. And you actually see this algorithmically. So if you actually apply this to a problem strategic classification, which I had mentioned a second ago, so it's a, a kind of, a, this is actually in like a financial example. So that's what I drew. And here, and I'm applying it in parameter regime where it's not supposed to work or at least it's not theoretically guaranteed to work, any of these algorithms. Uh, and so the, the blue is the repeat minimization. Uh, this orange is if you do proximal point with a very small regularization. And then if you do a little bit bigger regularization, here's the, here's the proximal point methods. And so what you see is with the strange behavior of repeat minimization is that, is that it's very oscillatory. That's what this is. This, it's highly unstable and very oscillatory. And so in practice, it turns out to be pretty useful to introduce a proximal point regularization. It works much better. So just a little note. Small, small regularization allows you to escape these uh, sort of strange oscillatory behaviors. Okay, very good. So, uh, okay, so now, but those are somehow conceptual algorithms. All of these are conceptual in the sense that um, they allow you to, uh, they require to be able to access the full data. Okay, do a full pass through all the data. You need to compute, you need to actually solve this problem somehow which is an expectation. This is a hard problem to solve in general, right? Okay, so let's not, so now I'm going to pass to these algorithms that simply take a stochastic, let's say gradient step or stochastic proximal point to kind of dual average and update uh, once uh, per iteration and then switch the distribution. So you take standard static algorithms and you allow the distribution to vary. And, uh, and uh, so that's what I'm going to analyze next. So, so the rest of the talk is about that. Um, and to analyze it, there are essentially two lemmas uh, that I need and they're fundamental. So like I, like I said, the, the way we're, I'm gonna be thinking about these algorithms and how to analyze these algorithms is that these algorithms are just passing, they're just passing through a sequence of static problems, but they only do a single update, let's say, or a few updates per step, okay? Uh, and uh, so what's critical is to understand how these algorithms vary along the distributions. And there are two lemmas I want to think about that are going to quantify that in a very uh, strong way. Uh, so first of all, so to, make, to, to make this precise, uh, uh, what do I need? So first of all, recall this notation. So again, F sub Y of X, so that's just the expectation over the distribution induced by Y uh, of the loss evaluated at X. Okay, and so, so ignore, ignore, ignore this for a moment. Okay, and so the question I want to ask is how does the gradient of this function vary, right? Like if I do stochastic gradient or any kind of gradient type method, I need to understand how does the gradient of this expectation function vary with respect to distribution y. And so the answer is very simple and this is very classical. So this is why well known. So if I just compute, if I just look at the variation of the gradient of this integral function and I, uh, with respect to the distribution, uh, that's going to be upper bounded linearly by the y minus y prime uniformly over all x. So you have a uniform bound between the errors and the gradients. They're controlled by how far away is y from y prime. Okay, that's because of uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, it's because of the assumptions we're making. Okay, so, so the, the, the beta and the gamma, right? the, the, the beta and the gamma come out. Okay, very good. So that's, that, this is very classical. And it just comes from uh, basically definition, of dual, dual characterization of y such timeline distance. Uh, very classical result. Uh, the other result is, is very interesting. So uh, I, like, I like the next result very much. Okay, so when we analyze algorithms, um, 
we want to think about variations also in function values, right? So when we, we, we are always, when we're doing algorithms, we're doing kind of, uh, you know, when we're analyzing algorithms, uh, what pops out all the time are function gaps, right? We're always measuring function gaps, right? So function value at X minus function value at a different point X prime uh, and measured in a static problem Y. So you, so the, let me introduce this notation, gap notation. So the gap relative to Y between point X and X prime, right? So it's just the function gap for the Y problem at two points, X and X prime. So it's very natural to ask, how does this quantity vary? And this quantity varies with Y in a really nice way. So I haven't seen this written down, but it's really nice. Okay, so the following is true. So I'm color coding, so it's easier to read. So if I look at the gap, so I look at the gap between two points X and X prime in the Y problem. I wanna think about what happens to the gap in the Y prime problem for the same points in X and X prime. And the error turns out to be multiplicative. The error, so if you wanna switch, when I think about how does the gap vary with respect to the, the, to the distribution, uh, what you get is a multiplicative error that multiplies X minus X prime and Y minus Y prime. And this is really, really useful. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so let, let me leave it at that. I, I have, I'd have some more comments, but, but let me, uh, yeah. okay. Very good. So in particular, actually, maybe let me back up. So in particular, if Y minus Y prime is itself on the order of X minus X prime, like if y and y prime depend on x and x prime, then the error is quadratic in x minus x prime. And algorithmically, so for the experts, you would imagine then the strong convexity could overcome these sorts of errors when shifting the distribution. That's exactly what happens. Okay, very good. So that's, those are the, the two deviation inequalities that are like, that are very fundamental, uh, I would say, that, 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 that I'm going to use. If, if uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so let me now start with algorithms. Okay, so the first uh, theorem I want to show you uh, says that um, uh, these sorts of problems with varying distributions are actually just a subset of online convex optimization. Okay, so you can apply any algorithms for any algorithm for online convex optimization to these problems. Um, uh, okay, and I'll tell you what sort of the downside of this kind of general general statement. Okay, so let me just recall what is online convex optimization. So online convex optimization is a repeated game. Okay, so the repeated game uh, proceeds as follows. Uh, there, is a, there is the player and there is nature. And, there, and nature is, uh, can be adversarial to the player. So the way that the player works is he chooses, so this is, uh, this is, unreal, this is just a review of online optimization, nothing to do with uh, uh, stochastic optimization at the moment or uh, uh, you know, the distributions vary. This is just what, what is the online convex optimization? The way it works as follows, so a player chooses a point xt in the domain of R, and then nature uh, reveals some loss function at time t, and the player pays a, pays a price, lt of xt. And you repeat like this. And the player's goal is to minimize the regret. Okay, so what is the regret? It's the total running loss, it's that the player has encountered up to time t, minus the minimal loss in hindsight. It's as if you had, so this is the minimum you, uh, loss you can attain as if you had all the knowledge of all the loss functions in hindsight. So that's the goal of, uh, of, of, of online convex optimization, to for the player to choose XT so that this quantity is small as possible. And there's a variety of algorithms in the settings. For example, proximal gradient, dual averaging, follow the regularized leaders. I won't describe them, but they are what you expect them to be. And uh, all the and the sort of guarantees um, for all these algorithms uh, are sort of similar uh, at a high level, and they kind of look like this. As long as the loss functions are strongly convex in the domain of R and are Lipschitz, then the regret grows only logarithmically in time. Okay, so regret grows only logarithmically. So you would, in the worst case, you would expect, oh, this is a sum of t terms. Uh, right, so this is the sum of t terms. Uh, so you want the regret to be sublinear, you don't want it to be t, but in fact, if you put these strong convexity and Lipschitz assumptions, it only grow, grows logarithmically in t. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the main, main, main uh, kind of the fundamental results in, in line convex optimization. Okay, so I claim you can apply any of such algorithms from online convex optimization to the problems where distribution is varying. Uh, and in fact, that's, the, the, that's, that's what uh, this, this theorem says. So uh, in the slightly suboptimal regime where rows between zero and one half, uh, you can run any online algorithm in, uh, where in iteration T, the natural thing occurs, nature just draws, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
z according to the current distribution and output the loss right so you do the obvious thing where nature this adversary just is stochastic now it draws zt according to the current distribution you incur incur the loss corresponding to that and now you take whatever online and then you apply your online algorithm up update like stochastic gradient etc and what you can prove is that in fact for any such algorithm the the gap uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Uh, so, so uh, it will be useful for me to introduce notation for the uh, for the objective value at equilibrium, right? So the point, remember the point of the meta theorem is to show that any algorithm uh, that we're going to be applying is really implicitly solving the problem at equilibrium. So I'll call that objective value phi. So phi is going to be the objective value at the where the distribution is induced by equilibrium. Okay. So if you run such an online algorithm, the expected uh, suboptimality gap after t iteration scales like the regret, expected regret over t. So if the expected regret scales like log t, you, do you get a rate? You get log t over t rate. And so that, that's what that is. And so uh, the only thing you lose is, you know, this kind of uh, linear is, is, is a term looks like one minus uh, two over all. It's kind of dampened. Okay. Very good. So, so this is pretty pretty neat because it's a reduction to online. Uh, you know, you can apply any online algorithm. The problem, the issue with online, the problem with online um, algorithms is that they require strong assumptions. They require bounded domains and Lipschitz loss functions. And so you would expect that maybe uh, this problem class where the distribution is varying is much closer to stochastic optimization than this to online optimization. Okay, and so that's what I'll flush next. So, uh, Radha, how much time do I have left? Uh, I would say, yeah, seven minutes, eight minutes. Okay, so then, I'll, okay, so I'll skip the proofs and I'll just tell you kind of the mm -hmm. results. Okay, so, so okay, so the, the, the punchline, right, is that from this kind of uh, simple, uh, from this theorem, we see that uh, uh, you can apply any online algorithm to these settings, but in fact, um, uh, uh, the, 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 these problems with varying distributions are actually much closer to static problems than they are to online problems. Okay, and so uh, I'll just flash some results for uh, specific algorithms. Uh, and there are all these uh, um, results are gonna hold under standard assumption that you make in stochastic optimization, which is a finite variance. So I'll assume from now on that the gradient of the loss has a finite variance. Okay, so the so for every distribution, so for every x, we have the distribution d of x. The expectation of the gradient is by definition this quantity, and so this. Uh, so I'm just assuming finite variance. Okay, so I'll just go through a bunch of algorithms and tell you what the results look like. Um, okay, so if you just apply a stochastic, if you apply a stochastic uh, um, approximal gradient method, then you get exactly the sort of rate that you would expect. So in the regime, in a slightly suboptimal regime where rho is smaller than one half, you will get epsilon optimality and function value using so many samples where kappa is the condition number and you get this kind of sigma squared over alpha epsilon. It's exactly what you, you get in, this, in the static setting, uh, except uh, or the O is hiding in terms that depend on rho. So to simplify notation, there's one over one minus two rho. So these kinds of fractures floating around so that this, these rates degrade uh, when, when, when you know, you're approaching kind of the limit of the, of the rho, okay? And then the parameter regime, in the optimal parameter regime, you get a rate at which the distance to the equilibrium is smaller than epsilon. So it's exact, exactly the same rates as, in the, uh, as, as you would expect in the static setting, except that, um, uh, you know, now, now, now the distribution is allowed to move a little bit. Okay, and I should, uh, and so if uh, I should mention that uh, this result with the last iterate convergence, uh, essentially the same result uh, was proved uh, when the R is the indicator function of a convex set was proved in this uh, er, earlier paper. Okay, so really the 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 this is a, uh, the new thing here is the proximal setting and the fact that we can get control on the function gap at equilibrium. Okay, so I'll skip the proof because it's uh, there's no time. Okay, so then you can ask, okay, what about acceleration? Does acceleration work? And so the answer, you at first you probably say no, acceleration is does not do well with errors, does not do well with bias, um, and, but in fact it does. So here's an accelerated uh, here's an accelerated algorithm where the only thing that's different from the from a, a, an accelerated um, algorithm that's in uh, uh, that's really uh, 
So, so there are two versions of stochastic, there, there are a few different versions of stochastic accelerated gradient methods. And I'm using the one that's due to Kulinchkov and Myral. And so the only thing that's different is that the distribution is just allowed to vary. So don't, don't worry about the details here. Uh, so it's some, acceler some accelerated method, but now the distribution is varying. Uh, and it turns out uh, we can prove the following. Uh, and it's kind of a funny result. So it's not, so in a parameter regime, so, so in the accelerated method, your methods, you're worried about error accumulation. Um, but it turns out that if rho is smaller than one over fourth root of kappa, which is, which is a pretty small quantity, okay, this is a one over fourth root of kappa. So it's not a constant, but it's, it's small. It's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, you know, it's, it's reasonably big, this, this uh, in kappa to the minus one fourth. Uh, in fact, you get an accelerated rate. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of surprising, I, I, I think. Uh, and surprising, even more surprisingly, it works great. So acceleration works great. It turns out in these. Uh, so acceleration works better than the theorem suggests it should. So I'm just going to flash. Uh, so th this is what happens with different uh, choices of gamma for a strategic classification problem. And this is gradient descent. The blue and the orange is accelerated gradient. And you see that accelerated gradient just uh, works much better. And at a certain point, everything breaks down when gamma is sufficiently big. It's way outside the regime of rho. And, and then uh, nothing works. Okay, But when it works, uh, accelerated gradient seems to work great. OK. Uh, good. And so the last, uh, the last kind of thing I want to mention, just maybe one slide. Um, okay. So what about other algorithms? What about uh, going beyond grade, simple gradient methods? Uh, so for example, you can think about proximal point, clip gradients, clip gradient methods, et cetera. Uh, so here I just uh, took two different examples where, you know, the, the gradient update uses linear models of the loss. You could also think about proximal point, which samples and uses the loss itself, clip gradient, which clips the gradient at the, at a certain value, the, which is a lower bound than the optimal value. And then you use those models to update um, uh, to, in an update step. So just, just uh, don't worry too much about this algorithm, but you know, just think about the proximal point method, okay? So does that work? And the answer is uh, yes, it works. Uh, so, so yes, it works. So uh, let me, I don't have time to, describe, to discuss the, all these constants, but it's exactly, the, you get exactly the rates that you would expect in this much more general setting where you have, um, you can choose better models than linear um, uh, for updating your steps. Okay, so stochastic proximal points, stochastic clip, clip gradient, do they satisfy the same sort of rates you'd expect in the, the static setting, but you know, but 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 with the with um, uh, in this more dynamic setting as well. Okay, so let me skip the proof, um, uh, and let me uh, just let me uh, maybe let me just stop here. Okay. So, so the details uh, and the ma many more results are in this uh, paper that will come out on archive tomorrow, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dima, for a very nice talk. So very nice, fresh results. So it's time for questions. So then uh, let me start. So uh, is the... Yeah, is it possible to to extend the the approach to the case when L is not differentiable in X? Let's say by using some uh, smoothing techniques or yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a good question. So in fact, um, smoothness in X was not essential. Smoothness in Z was essential. Oh, sorry, not smooth. Lipschitz, uh, Lipschitz continuity of the subdifferential in X in mm -hmm. Z, Z variable, that was, that, that's what, what's really important. So if you need to describe, to define that appropriately, and then this, this, the really uh, smoothness in X does not matter. It's just, the, it's just like a subgradient in the variable X should vary in a good way with respect to Z. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but in all examples, the problem is that, uh, all, the, that I know uh, kind of, if, if, you, if you're smooth in Z, you're also smooth in X. So that's why, I didn't, that's why I didn't bother sort of working out the details of that because the smoothness in Z and C smoothness in X somehow in all examples I'm aware of kind of go hand in hand, but okay. it's not essential. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So are there other questions? Jonathan? So, yeah, so in these experiments were you just resampling from some fixed data set? Yeah, so or, this is a financial data set of um, where you're trying to predict um, 
uh, whether a person is going to default on a loan. Uh, and I'm just um, in that data set, it's called Kaggle, it's, it's from Kaggle. Uh, it's, it has like 10 features uh, and I'm using like, uh, sorry, it has 10, right. uh, yeah, it has 10 features uh, and uh, I'm using like a thousand data points and three of the features are strategic, which means that those features are updated after every uh, deployment of, of the classifier. Okay, yeah, but it's, I mean, it seems in theory you could you could sort of work with a new sample every single time, right? From some unknown infinite data set, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah, definitely. So in these examples, I the, the way it works in strategic classification is that um, I am it's like a finite sum problem. So I'm, I am sampling from a big sum basically. Right. Right. It's just that the 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 features are moving around, so it's as if the distribution is moving. Yeah. 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 But it important. doesn't. But your theory would work also for for like completely online sort of just yes, getting absolutely. examples up. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Konstantin Mischenko. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask you in terms of applications, if we can model reinforcement learning with this approach and so what so would be the limitations? Yeah, so the um, so the way that uh, like for so this problem class the it go, in, in machine learning literature was introduced under this name of performative prediction, this paper of Perdomo model. And um, uh, they, they make a very strong, good point there, which is that, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot in between static problems and reinforcement learning. And so what this problem class is, is it's much closer to static problems than it is to reinforcement learning. Because in reinforcement learning, uh, you don't have these kinds of, you, you have a very strong variations in distribution. We don't have any control on how the, you don't have this Lipschitz control on how distributions vary. And in fact, uh, what, what we show, right, is that uh, that first result I had mentioned, in fact, shows that um, that uh, this problem class is even inside online optimization. So it's, it's really much, much smaller. This problem class is really much, much smaller than reinforcement learning, which allows you to have, in some sense, uh, strong, strong guarantees. Yeah. So somehow reinforcement learning is, is, is far out of this realm. Thank you. Thank you. Rohan? Hey, Professor, thanks for the talk. Just a quick question about the equilibrium. So uh, I was wondering, like, for example, in the case with the bank loans and the perturbations, um, what is kind of like the intuition behind the equilibrium? Like, how would that look in, in that concrete example? So in that concrete example, that just means that there is no incentive for the bank. So like, so, so the bank is thinking about, they're going to deploy a classifier uh, and their goal is to, for this classification to do well, not according to the data they used for obtaining the classifier, but it's to predict well according to the response data from the population. So you can imagine so that, so that, that classifier would just, uh, that equilibrium uh, just satisfies the property that, uh, you know, you deploy the classifier, the distribution adapts to it strategically in order to, to improve their likelihood of being positively classified or negatively classified. Then uh, it's as if the bank would re-optimize and ask the question, okay, if, according to this new data, was the, uh, was the classifier optimal? The one that generated the data, was it actually optimal with respect to the data it generated? If the answer is yes, then it's at equilibrium. There's no closed form expression for it or anything of the sort. Okay. Uh, but that's like philosophically what it means. There's no incentive to, uh, for, given only the response distribution for the, uh, you know, the, the bank to, to, to change the way they do classification. Sure. So after that case, there'd be no more like perturbations kind of. Yeah. It's like having the current data, there'd be no incentive. It's, it's having the response, <laughs> there is no incentive to change what you did, roughly speaking. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and this is really, really beautifully explained in, in the paper of strategic, uh, there's a paper called strategic classification. Um, and I don't remember who the authors are. It's, for, it's uh, from um, uh, Moritz Hart is one of the authors. Uh, and and uh, I think it's three or four, four co-authors and they, they explain it beautifully. beautifully. Um, yeah. And so it's a very popular topic now in machine learning. So Dima, I have another question. Yep. So how much can one go beyond the 
this Lipschitz condition yeah, you, you imposed on distribution? Well, the, see, the problem is that even in this simple example, not, you can't really go too far out of it in theory, okay. right? Because where's my example? Yes. So as soon as you, even in the simple examples, kind of the point of this example is to show it's very tight. As soon as you leave the, you know, this parameter regime that's in fact dictated by the theory, um, gradient flows and all these sorts of things going out, tend to go in the opposite direction sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but now that's not what you see in in actual examples. So if you if like in this example, strategic classification from which I had all the rest of the pictures, uh, that's not actually what you see. It takes the, the the parameter regime where algorithms work is way wider than um, what you expect it to be. So in this toy example, yes, you can compute, etc. But somehow in the structured examples, it, it seems that these algorithms work in a much much wider regime than than what they're designed for. Especially if you do introduce quadratic regularization. Yeah, this was sort of okay. the point, this point, uh, this example I had was uh, for mm -hmm. the repeated minimization. Uh, somehow if you also introduce quadratic regularization, things tend to work, which suggests yeah. to me that there's some kind of local phenomenon happening that's not uh, reflected in, um, yeah. like in these con concrete problems, there's some kind of local phenomenon happening that, that are not taken into account um, more broadly. This, this uh, is impressive behavior. I mean, yeah, good. I mean, yeah. so then let us stop here. Dima, thank you very much for a nice talk. So, Thanks. So it was a great pleasure to have you now in our seminar. So nice topic, nice talk. So looking forward to, to your paper. So Thanks, have a nice Simon. day. Thank you very much. I just want to, to announce that the next speaker is will be the Feng Sun from Hong Kong next Monday, same time. So I wish you a nice week. And uh, of course, we'll post the, the slides and the video of Diva's talk on our website. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.